Okay, so last time, that was uh, one week ago, basically, it was Wednesday, and uh, we stopped the year. So before starting to speak about this, while we wait maybe for another um, couple of people connecting or maybe a few more, uh, let me remind you one thing, give you one news, let's say. I already mentioned that on Slack, uh, but let me just, uh, repeat that uh, also in the video. Um, so as you may have no noticed uh, on the teaching portal, you now have access to the CPD uh, questionnaire. It is the questionnaire for the quality of teaching at uh, Politecnico. Uh, and as you know, because you are not uh, the first day that you are enrolling here, uh, this questionnaire has some parts that are more let's say, general and uh, pertain to uh, staff at the university as to consider like the, I don't know, the size of the room or the suitable equipment. So things that are not really something that we can, we as a teacher can act on, uh, if not saying yes, we agree on what they have said or something similar. Uh, but there are other parts that are really more related to the course and that are, well, some, some question uh, on, on a scale about the teachers, about the topic and something similar. And also the open comments field um, that when I was a student, that it was uh, the, the green sheet because it was a piece of paper that was green and which you can write and you could write on it. Um, so so that, that open question is, is for you if you want to leave comments uh, about the course, either positive things, also negative things as, as well, things that you didn't like at all or didn't like in part. Uh, and I, I but also on behalf of Professor Corno, we all encourage you to fill this questionnaire because we read about, we read all the comments. Last year we read all the comments and we also applied some of the, uh, let's say more, most significant and most popular requests into this edition of the course. So we are in a sense using a, a user center process also for this. And so we are refining and updating the course either from our perspective of things that uh, didn't go well and also from your as student perspective of things that didn't go well or that we don't explain uh, enough in, in a good way. And so we need to maybe explain better why we are taking some choices um, and, and not others, for instance. So this is, it was for, for last, for having five minutes uh, and waiting for other people to, to join. But essentially, please, uh, the questionnaire is open up to January, I think, and please fill it out um, as, as many of you as possible and leave some comments, constructive comments, kind comments, also negative, but constructive and kind, if possible. And we also volunteered, just to be in, uh, among in the news, uh, we also volunteered to have, for this year, this was an experimental thing that only some courses are doing, uh, for a post-exam questionnaire. So after the, the written exam, you will receive another questionnaire, different from the one that you have done for evaluating the course, just for the exam for evaluating the exam. Since you are filling this questionnaire before doing the exam and some questions are about the exam in this questionnaire, um, you will also receive a questionnaire shorter after the exam to see uh, what you think about the, the exam. This is an experimental questionnaire. Uh, we volunteer to have this experimental questionnaire. Uh, that, is, that was specifically uh, created by the university for uh, the remote exams, not for in-person exams. And so this will be another thing that you will be asked to, from the university to fill up for, fill, fill up for this course, a CPD evaluation for the exam also. And this will be obviously after the exam, not now. Okay, closing the news session. If you don't have any question, uh, so if you have any question, please write in the chat, I don't see anything. So I, I suppose that that was quite, uh, simple as a part. But again, if you have any question, the chat is there. Feel free to write as you now are used to do for many lecture. So 
last time let, let's let's turn here and speak about let's continue to speak about the usability evaluation so last time uh, we started to speak about evaluation and particularly user uh, evaluation and we stopped speaking about usability evaluation as a way to get a feedback about a prototype and application something that you did to get some feedback from the target user of your application and to, to learn something to catch some usability problems from the actual user that you uh, are targeting and we said yeah the last time last week that there are three main parts one is planning and then one is uh, conducting the, the actual usability evaluation and then there is the analysis part and the end of the uh, of the actual evaluation and we start to speak about the most important of these three parts that is the preparation the planning of the evaluation and we just to brief re remind you we have said that uh, the first things to do is decide who are your target user how many of them you need to require to to involve in the in the evaluation which role you are going to play as part of the evaluating team so that you need a facilitator. Probably it's better that designer, creators, developer are not serving as facilitator if possible in general. And then you have to choose which task do you want to ask your participant to perform and tasks must be concrete with a clear goal and around five to 10 tasks. And then you can also choose other things like a methodology. Do you want to apply a methodology for some of these tasks for all the, ta all the tasks, for none of these tasks, and so on. Uh, some criteria, some metrics for success, for failure of each separate task, and also for getting some information and then analyzing this information. And this additional information can be get before and or after the, the entire evaluation st uh, study, before or after each single task, and before or, or before and or after a meaningful group of tasks. After this information, you have to decide which equipment you need and prepare an informed consent form, prepare a, a script, a written test protocol, decide whether to have a debriefing session at the end of the test with participant individually or not. And once you have done all of this, you have to practice your script with friends, with colleagues, so not your target user, to catch the most, uh, let's say, evident error, the most important things that can go wrong. And then you can start actually subministering the, the test and doing your usability evaluation with one user, one participant at a time. And last time, we started to uh, speak a little bit about uh, the inform consent form as a way to let the user, the participant to know what is expecting to happen in this in the study, that everything that go wrong is not their own fault, but it's obviously fault of the application, that there is no wrong or right answer, that you are there for learning, getting feedback, not for judging people. Today, we are briefly we are speaking about uh, methodology. So which are these methodologies that you can apply? Uh, we are speaking about metrics. So which are these criteria? What does it mean having a criteria for success and failure? How we count this criteria in the end? And all this information, including standard or pseudo standard questionnaire that can be done after the test, after the task, or after a subset of, of tasks, obviously. And also a bit about the equipment that you may need. Tomorrow, we are going to do an exercise on, on the planning on the preparation of the usability evaluation. And we are going to write basically the beginning, uh, a quick draft of the script that uh, you have to prepare for also doing your usability evaluation of the prototype. So let's start speaking about the matrix. For matrix here, we mean both the criteria of success and failure for each task and also other background information or other additional information that you may ask for your participant or you want to collect from your participant. And matrix more or less, uh, let's say we, we split this matrix in subjective matrix 
and quantitative matrix. Uh, so subjective matrix can happen in a, a few different moments. It can happen prior to the test with a single participant like and asking like background information. Uh, such as the age, uh, the experience with a specific uh, with a specific tool or with a specific sector of technology. Uh, so if you are doing a mobile application, you maybe are interested in recruiting people with a certain amount of knowledge about the mobile phone, not people that have never have seen before a mobile phone. So prior to the session, you can ask this background information, you give the participant the informed constant form to fill, and you maybe have a questionnaire about demographics and, and similar things. Then after each task scenario, uh, or at the end of the task, you can have other questions that you may pose to the user. And this could be to the participant. And this could be free form text uh, question, like a sort of interview and the, maybe the debriefing session, or you can have more specific question like, how much, how much was easy to use the prototype or how you satisfied to use the prototype. And this could be about the entire test, so the entire prototype experience, but also about the single task. So you can ask the ease and satisfaction of use for each specific task if you want. It depends obviously from the information you want to collect for that specific task and for the entire um, study. Uh, and what you need to do with this information. So after each task, you can ask this, this question with a questionnaire for some task, for others, not for others, for all the task uh, with a certain uh, freedom to do. And in the end of the, the, the test, in the end of the session with a participant, you can also ask for the overall ease of use, for the overall satisfaction. And also for things like, do you recommend do you, will you recommend these, this application, this system uh, to another person or not? And then you can also have some, as I said before, more open-ended question uh, with the participant, typically at the end of the session. And these are subjective matrix. They could be either qualitative or quantitative, but they are subjective because it's the participant that give their own impression, their own ideas about uh, how, he's, how easy to use was or its own satisfaction to use the task, to use the prototype or to complete the task. And then you have quantitative metrics that are obsolete metrics that you compute on the participant actions. So they are bound in a, in a way to the participant, but they are uh, quantitative. So there are things that you are actually measuring in the test. And this thing could be a successful completion rate. So how much this task was completed? 100% completed, 90% completed, 50% completed, not completed at all. Uh, error rates, how many errors users are doing per task overall for a subset of tasks? How many time users spent on a specific task? I know that this task should last three minutes. If all the users spend between five and 12 uh, minutes, probably my expectation were wrong and I need to understand why they are spending so much time, which is that is not working and slowing down the task that I'm planning to be shorter and quicker. So here, uh, there are a series of the most common metrics, either subjective and um, quantitative about tasks that you typically want to, to investigate. You maybe are not interested in getting all these metrics in a single uh, usability evaluation. Obviously is, as I said before, up to you, up to the goal of your specific uh, test and the goal of your specific task. Maybe for some tasks, you are not interested in getting the number of errors because for any reason it's not relevant, it's not important there. Uh, but for other, maybe it's particularly important to understand how many errors uh, your participants are doing per task overall for all the tasks and so on. And these are the most common metrics that are used. It, again, not all together, you can also choose, 
uh, which of them using, but these are the most common. The first one that is basically used everywhere, every time, is the successful task completion. So whether the task is completed successfully or not by a given participant. So what does it mean completion of a task? It means that the task is successfully completed when a participant indicates that they have found the answer or completed the task. So if the task is booking a room, when the participant did some action and said, okay, I've done, or I think to have, um, to have booked the room as you asked, that is the task completed. And how you can let's say, measure the completion of the task, again, it depends if, if you want, would like to have some details about this process or not. If you don't want to have details, just to say the task is completed or the task is not completed, like or is perfectly completed or is not completed at all, you can have just a Boolean value, like completed yes, not completed no, true or false, if you want to, to stick with the Boolean concept. Or you can also have a scale between zero and 100 or zero and 10. And so saying that the task is successfully totally completed with 100 and if the user uh, miss some detail is going to be completed with 90 and if the user miss some other detail is 80 and so on so you can also have some variety and this how much reducing this number from 100 to 90 or to 80 is again up to you deciding which details you are asking to to the user and uh, how important they are towards the completion of the task and this detail this reduction of number is typically split in two kinds of errors, the critical errors and the non-critical errors. So let me make an example. Let's imagine that you have an application for booking rooms and the task is uh, book a room able to host 25 people uh, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. on Monday. So you have a very specific task, it's very concrete, and has three important details. You have a date, in this case it's Monday. Uh, you have an hour, uh, 6 to 7 p.m. on Monday, and you have uh, a size of the room, a room capable of hosting 25 people. So the task to be, for the task to be successfully completed, you should, uh, the participant should not only book the room, we should book a room that is large enough for 25 people and from 6 to 7 p.m. and on Monday and not on Wednesday. So what happens if the user just book a room? Is the task not completed at all or is just partially completed? So it book a room but on any day of the week from 3 to 5 p.m. and books a room for 10 people. So obviously the task is not totally successful completed, uh, but and you have some errors, but the task could be considered as completed because the action, the main activity that was booking a room was performed and the room is booked. Then you have some errors and you can split this error in critical errors and non-critical errors. Uh, the critical errors are deviation at completion from the target of the task so that the participant cannot finish the task. So it's not that the user booked the room, it's that the user did something, the application did something that the user cannot book the room in the end. Because there is a mandatory field that the user is not seeing because the user interface is not presenting uh, the mandatory field well and or it's out of screen. And so the user cannot fill that mandatory field and is not able to book the room because it needs to complete this mandatory field, but the, this mandatory field, it's out of screen, for instance. So errors that prevent the completion of the task or the user is trying to book the room from the wrong page because he thought the user, the participant thought that uh, for booking a room, uh, that section should be 
uh, the right section because it, maybe there is a book button, but it's not booking a room, it's booking something else. Hmm? So errors that prevent the task to be completed. And participant with this type of error may or may not be aware that the task goal is incorrect or incomplete. So maybe they say, I've done. So maybe they say, I, I, I cannot complete the task. And so it's obviously a task incomplete. But maybe they also say, okay, I'm done thinking to have booking the room and say they are booking the swimming pool. So obviously the task is not completed because you have to book a room and not a swimming pool. But maybe the, the participant thought that it's, it's fine to have booking the, the, the swimming pool because it, she, see, she sees only the swimming pool as a possible room and he booked the swimming pool. So obviously the task is not completed and there is a critical error that prevent the completion of the task. And this is typically an absolute or relative number. Uh, it could be uh, one, one error, two error, three errors, critical errors, or could be also uh, uh, 25 percent of errors and, and something similar. And then you have non-critical errors that are errors that are recovered by the participant. So I, I need to book the room for 25 people. I'm booking the room for 10. And then before pressing save, pressing save, uh, I say, oh no, wait, it was for 25 people. So go back and edit. This is obviously not a critical an error that was made in the process, but it's an error that is recovered by the participant before the end of the task. Uh, and do not result in the participant's ability to successfully complete the task. And another kind uh, of non-critical errors could be also dismissing details. So let's imagine again that you have to book a room for 25 people and the but is again, uh, also subjective to what you want to measure in that, that you want to want, what you are interested in, in that specific task. So again, let's imagine that you have to book a room for 25 people as a task. Um, the use, the participant is booking a room for 50. So obviously the task is completed and obviously the task is fine because 25 people can stay in a room of 50. It's larger, it's perfect, but it's not what you maybe were interested in um, because maybe they use the participant didn't see uh, an option for in decreasing that number and 50 was the default value of the size of the room, for instance. So actually the task was completed, it was completed successfully in a way, but maybe not 100% successfully, and you can remove something because there an app happens a non-critical error that didn't prevent the task to be completed, but is not optimal. So you can have errors that happens and that the user recovered, like I'm going there and then say, no, it's not here. And this is obviously errors that happens in the completion of the task, or you can also have some missing details from the task that can, inf uh, they can have an impact on the successful task completion. And then again, you can decide that booking a room with for 25 people uh, for, for the task to be completed successfully, it, the task should be exactly completed with booking a room for exactly 25 people. So you are booking a room with 50 people, you say the task is entirely failed. Again, it's up to you. It, again, it's, it's more about what you are interested in looking at the specific task and the specific action of the participant. So these are all the possible choices. You can choose that booking a room is enough and I'm going to assign uh, 90 as a scale, a scale here for a successfully completion because actually the participant booked the room just not with the right detail. Or you can say, no, this is a total failure because the task was very precise and the user did not uh, perform correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are numbers that you can calculate, compute for each task separately. And then you can have also an idea of which are the most critical tasks for your application, we generate a much more error, critical and non-critical. And so you may have task number one, that is 100 for all the participants and task number two, that is maybe 50 
for all the participant in main for all the participants. Uh, and so you can you can understand that task number two is particularly difficult uh, or you have some something to investigate more on task number two. Uh, you can also compute the error free rate that is the percentage of participant or complete a specific task. Again, all of these are on specific tasks and then you can put together for all the tasks for that participant or for uh, all the participant on that task. The error free rate is the percentage of participant who completed the task without any error. So who completed the task with 100 if you are using the scale. So perfectly. And this could be 100% of participant complete the task number one uh, without error or it could be less, obviously not more. Then you can also be interested in having the time on task. So the amount of time it takes the participant to complete the task. As I said before, maybe you, you think or you need that a specific task is done in one minute because it's a, it's in a critical environment, it's a critical task, you cannot uh, waste time. It's a user interface for a doctor in a hospital and the doctor cannot stay three days in understanding where to click or when to touch on a, on a user interface. It needs something really, really quick uh, to do. So maybe you have a specific time in mind or a desired time and you want to check that this time is respected more or less so that you can act, get feedback to reduce the time if, if it is too uh, long uh, or if it's maybe right, but there are too many errors. So you can either approximate to a longer time or trying to fix the source of errors. So this is another matrix that you can have, the time on task. Again, the amount of time it takes the participant to complete the task and obviously it's, it's time. It could be seconds, could be minutes, could be hours, it depends on the kind of task and how these can be uh, computed. This could be either computed by you manually. So with, with a timer, okay, task number one, start the timer. The task is ending, stop the timer and take notes of the, of the number that you see on the timer. It could be computed after the, the evaluation. If you maybe are video recording or audio recording the entire test, you have the timestamp on when the task number one is started or and it's ended, or it could be also computed automatically by your prototype. So you set up the prototype to support the task. So when the, the user click on a certain point, it's the beginning of task number one. So you get the timestamp from the software itself. Different choices, more or less the same results with different maybe uh, precision, but more or less are, are, are the same, different requirements, obviously. And these are, let's say, the more quantitative measure that you can have on tasks, on single task. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense to have um, criteria matrix for all the tasks together. Uh, you can measure the time that is needed to complete all the tasks, but it's maybe it's not a, a really useful measure because you maybe are more interested in the time needed for complete each task separately or each subset of task. And then you have instead things that could be applied to the specific task, a subset of task or entire test that are the subjective measure like the self-reported participant rating for satisfaction, ease of use, ease of finding information, um, agreement on some statement, uh, agreement on whether they will recommend uh, the application or not, uh, et, et cetera. That could be a Likert scale from one to five or to one to seven, uh, from one being uh, not at all and five being uh, the easiest to use in the world or, or something similar. And then you can also have some free text or uh, you can have this information in an open question by voice about what the participant liked, disliked, and any recommendation that the participant may have. So what participant liked the most about the system, about the prototype, the interface, what they liked the least, any recommendation that they have. Like, yes, I clicked here in the task 
Uh, I often click here uh, for completing some task because I didn't understand what does mean. So this is maybe something that doesn't emerge from a task specifically, but if the user is continuing to click to moving in a specific page, it could be something that he found uh, strange or problematic or unclear, and maybe just she wants to, to know more. And this could be something that uh, the user, the participant can tell you after in one of these uh, free text uh, question or just in a debriefing a session in which you are asking, why do you click always in that place? Because you notice something strange that happening in front of you. And this, both the subjective measure and the like, dislikes and recommendation may happen after a specific task, uh, but typically they happen after uh, a meaningful part of the test. Maybe the first three tasks were about a specific topic and other three tasks were about another topic different. So maybe you have one moment for questionnaire after three tasks and another moment after the other three, or just at the end of the entire session, follow up, followed by uh, uh, the briefing session if needed. For, uh, especially for open question and subjective measure, there are, there exist reliable and validated questionnaire for this kind of measure. And we are going to see, uh, I think three of them in a few slides. But again, this questionnaire, given that the usability evaluation is not, uh, let's say, founded on scientific basis, is just, as we said the last time, uh, let's give our application to some people, let's having them complete our task and get some feedback from them so that we can improve the application, the system. Also the questionnaire uh, that we, you, can, you can have are, Typically, one of them is a subtitle, a quick and dirt way to. So they are quick and dirt, and they are, let's say, quite approximate, not, not very, again, scientific, but can give you specific information about what to change uh, or how well is performing your application, or how bad is performing your application according to some usability criteria and definitions. So these are the most common metrics. And then we are saying that, that we said that for each task, you can choose to apply some methodology. Uh, you can choose to apply no methodology at all. So just giving the task, having the uh, user perform the task and then new task and start again. Or you can apply some kind of methodology per task. You can have maybe the first task without methodology, the second task with the think aloud methodology that is here in slides and the third task again, without methodology and so on. Uh, or you can maybe just pick a couple of, of, of tasks to apply a specific methodology. Mm -hmm. So the methodologist needs to get more information from just the specific uh, execution, the specific matrix. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the think aloud methodology is a methodology in which the user, as the name say, is uh, expected to think aloud, mm -hmm. to say, what they are doing and what they are thinking. So here there is the description. While the participant perform a task, she asks to describe what she's doing and why, what she thinks is happening, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm moving the mouse, I'm going to click here. I don't know where I think here, there is a button here. And when I click the button, I'm expecting that this will happen. And then the participant click the, the button. So it has to vocalize what uh, he is, she is about to do and why she is choosing to do that. Uh, there are obviously in this thing and this methodology, uh, some advantages and some disadvantages. Uh, among the advantages, obviously this methodology is pretty simple. So everybody can understand how to do the think aloud and conduct it very well. Just to have to speak before doing and saying what they are planning to do or they're just doing now. Can provide useful insights of the methodology because you are asking the people to vocalize in a way their thoughts. So you are understanding, you're seeing, you're listening in this case, the process that unfold in the mind of the people while they're using the system. And obviously can show how the system is actually used 
okay, I will click here because I think that this button is the right button to press for complete this task. And then we not, but at least you see the reasoning behind that specific action that otherwise you will not see. You just say, okay, this is an error, critical or not critical. So simple, can provide a lot of insights and sh can show how the system or the application is actually used. As obviously some disadvantages. So first of all, the act of describing things alter the performance of the task, the matrix of the task. You cannot, for instance, measure time on a task with a think aloud um, methodology. Because you cannot say this is the time that the task is needed to, to have. Because people are thinking, people are, people are speaking, uh, people are explaining. So they are spending more time on that task that without uh, saying anything and just clicking where they want and so on. So this alter some task performance because there is reasoning, because there is speaking, because there is communication. So give also the act of thinking and having to say something will create more consciousness about uh, the consciousness about uh, what the user is going to do with respect to just clicking somewhere. This is also very subjective. It's just what those participants are thinking. It's not that all the participant will think in that exact way about a specific uh, application or a specific action. But you can have some insights from that and obviously you have some limitation from the other side. For some task is really important, the most complex task in which you are not interested in how many how much time it lasts. It could be interesting to have this information to understand that maybe you know that the task is specifically problematic or the task is generating a lot of errors and you can, with this methodology, try to understand which is the reason that brings to that those errors. So think allows, think allowed uh, is typically done during the task. So this task will be done with think aloud. Think aloud is this, and this is the facilitator. And then the participant from that moment say, okay, I'm moving the mouse here, etc., etc., etc. But it can also be done retroactively. So after the task, after the session. Uh, the participant could, uh, could the, the facilitator could ask the participant, tell me what uh, you have done and why. So recreate the operation. This is obviously a little bit longer as a time and it could be also difficult to remember for the participant what uh, she did in the task number three after maybe a 15 minute session and 10 different tasks. So it, this reconstruction could be not really uh, identical to what happened the first time. But it could be possible if you are okay with this limitation, it could be also possible to uh, have the think aloud methodology in this retroactive way. Obviously when you apply this as an retroactive way, you can measure the time in the original task because the original task didn't have the think aloud that compromise errors, times or other things. Uh, another methodology that you can apply if you want is the, this called the cooperative evaluation. That is a variation of the think aloud. In the cooperative evaluation, instead of having the participant saying what they are planning to do and why and uh, etc., cetera, uh, you have the participant and the facilitator that they are collaborating in the evaluation, in the task completion. So the facilitator in the cooperative evaluation stop to be a observer and a, a person that give task and help just in case of disasters, but work together with the participant. So each other ask question, uh, reflect on things. Uh, so they converse together during uh, the task. Again, 
I don't know if we have the disadvantages as before. This is totally subjective, and you uh, you cannot measure time on this kind of uh, of task with this methodology because you not only have the participant that is speaking and vocalizing their thoughts, but also the the, the facilitator that is speaking, posing questions. So the time is totally uh, unreliable, and also the errors probably are not really reliable as major. But you have also additional advantages with respect to the think aloud. So you can ask clarification. Why do you think that pressing this button here produced the right answer, the right results or the expected results? A user could be the participant could be encouraged to criticize the system. Oh yes, I, I, indeed, I don't understand this label here. What does it mean? Um, it's less constrained than the think aloud because it's enable a conversation. Uh, so it's not the participant that they have to speak alone, uh, just vocalizing the thought, but it's, it's in conversation with another person, the facilitator, they can also guide the conversation if needed a bit. And so it's also easier to use because there is the facilitator that is facilitating the think aloud in this form, this is cooperative evaluation. And so these are the two main methods that one is a variation of the other that you can use during the usability testing for getting additional insights on a specific task. So metrics, uh, methodologies. Now let's speak a bit about equipment. So we have seen, sorry, I have a question. Um, Uh, the question is about cooperative evaluation, I guess. Uh, since the facilitator does it for each test session, is there the chance that they can go do things different in different sessions? Obviously, yes. But actually for the cooperative evaluation, probably this is the point. So in the cooperative evaluation, the point is that the facilitator uh, is helping the, the participant to vocalize things, to vocalize the thought. So it's, let's say that the, the participant is driving the conversation and the facilitator is getting insights differently from one participant to the other uh, because all the participants will behave differently. And it can also maybe pose some question to the um, participant because maybe the participant that, the, that he is seeing before did something and he want to understand if the same problem that arises in the participant uh, minus one happens also here. So in this case, it's expected that the facilitator is doing something different among session because the goal here is understanding the pro the mental thought, the mental process, um, the matching, you say, the mental model of the user while, while using the application doing that task. Uh, so there are there is no technical cooperation, all interaction to help the tester express their thought, yes. It's just speaking. So the user, is the participant is still using the prototype with the mouse, the keyboard, with touch screen, whatever. The facilitator is just there, a friend that is helping the, the, the participant to use the application and to more than to use, to understand, uh, to, to express themselves in, in explaining what they are, what, he, what she is doing, what the participant is doing. So there is not technical cooperation. There is not, ah, uh, yes, this is a bug. Nothing like that. It's just for helping the participant to, to expose better, to give more information about the task. So it's a think aloud with some help to better think aloud. And again, these two methodologies, uh, so it's quite, quite, quite often the think aloud methodology is used, the cooperative evaluation a little bit less. Um, but they are obviously very, very close uh, one another. And for, again, typically they're used for specific tasks in which you are interested in getting more insights about what the user is thinking and what the user is planning to do. Um, and you are not, it's not mandatory that uh, usability evaluation has think aloud in at least one task. You can have a uh, usability evaluation with, without any methodology applied. Uh, equipment. So we have seen last time that the, there is the classical usability testing lab that is a laboratory with at least two connected room that are outfitted with audio visual equipment. And then you have the screen, a window, uh, a glass 
between these two rooms in which in one room you have the server in the other room you have the, the participant alone that is working on a computer or on a mobile phone or whatever and this is the most structured way for conducting the usability testing but any other of these things that is written in these slides could be suitable so you have a room with portable recording equipment a room with table and um uh, and the computer on the table, let's say, or the smartphone on the table, and a video cam a camera in front of it, and, and so on. Or a room with no recording at all, but you have three observers that are continuously to, to write down notes and taking times and uh, recording videos only audio with a smartphone, or it's the, the application that is uh, a, um, recording information like timestamps like actions like where the user is touching the screen or where the user is clicking and so it's collecting other kind of information from other sources or you can have also it obviously remotely this is also true for let's say normal time not not only with the pandemic um, so you can have participants in a different uh, location it could be moderated so with a facilitator that is moderating or also totally unmoderated with just the participant to receive the list of tasks and maybe there is a screen recording and which you see in which after the facilitator and the server can see everything that happens and maybe have a debriefing session the day after or in another, another moment so it could be done in a verse way uh, but the main things the test the tasks of, the methodologies, the metrics are always, uh, could be always present and are horizontal on these choices of specific place, a specific modality presence or, or not. And well, some material that you can use uh, for, for the equipment. So starting from paper and pencil, that is cheap to just keep note, uh, audio, that is very, very useful actually for Think Aloud because if you record the user, you can re-listen to what, what the participant talked while, while doing the task. Uh, you can have also video, obviously, that is the most accurate, the most realistic because you are recording everything, not only the audio, but also the expression of the user, the question, uh, maybe the, the facial expression and maybe what is doing on the screen. So you can have not only a video, a camera, but you can also have screen recording together. Uh, typically, it needs some special equipment like a, a camera, the right lights, uh, and the right illumination, uh, and then saving everything, give, asking for more, a lot more of permission to the users, etc. And as a disadvantage, a video can maybe obtrusive. So having a camera that is recording you. Uh, all the time could generate a uh, different behavior from the user. So sometimes the camera is not really uh, evident, it's maybe hidden a bit or placed in a way that is more comfortable for, for the user, just not front in face of the user recording. You can have, as I said before, uh, also some computer logging. So your application, your prototype, your whatever, logging information from what the user is doing, where the user is clicking, when the user is clicking, and what is the previous action, what will be the next action, um, et cetera, et cetera. That is obviously automatic, is transparent for the user, uh, but in the end, you may have maybe a large amount of data. If you maybe uh, get one timestamp every time that the mouse is moving or every time that the user is clicking, uh, in the end, you have for a 10, for a 15 minutes task, you have a lot of data to analyze it and to understand it specifically. And you can also have an eye tracker. We have mentioned the trackers for all sorts other things, but obviously the trackers are could be really useful here to track and record where the user is looking in your application. So where are the areas in which the app map uh, in, that the user is creating while using the application? In practice, there is a mixed use of some of these things. Uh, so you typically have audio and video. Uh, and But when you have audio video, you have to, to transcript the video in text to analyze the text. That is difficult, time expensive, and requires skills. 
uh, it's not something trivial. And um, you can also have some automatic support tools for maybe screen recording or for logging some information uh, from the user. Either you are inserting these in your application, just saving somewhere some timestamp or some similar things, or you can use some software that contain your application and perform some of these operation when needed. So in practice, you have just a mix of use. You obviously, in a, let's say in an in-person world, you have paper and pencil quite a lot. Uh, you sometimes have audio or video. Um, so one of the two uh, typically is present. And sometimes you have computer logging for some operation, but maybe not, it's not again, it's not a comprehensive list that you have, you have need to have all of these. Uh, for sure you have paper and pencil, typically you have audio or video, and you can have some logging from your application if it's needed, if it's easier to maybe log the time of the, the completion of the task uh, from a software than from a timer on a, on, on, a, on a watch or on a smartphone. That is, again, absolutely uh, acceptable. And you typically have two, or two to three uh, note taker and observer that take a lot of notes. So the, the, if you have very good observer that take very good notes, uh, you are you can obtain very good results without having to audio record everything. Because if you have a lot of people that take notes with care, it's and maybe you have just screen recording or recording some specific part, it could be already enough to get a lot of information, maybe more information that you really want or need. Now, let's speak briefly about the uh, subjective measure that you can ask after each task or after the entire session. I mentioned to you that there is some uh, existing questionnaire that could be served after the task or after the entire questionnaire. So this one, that is the single is question, is a single question that uh, about difficulty of the task um, that is given post task. So it's a questionnaire, one question, actually, so it's a, it's a very small questionnaire, just one question uh, after each task. After each task, you can ask, you can ask overall, this task was from one to seven, so a Likert scale, where one is very difficult and seven is very easy. So this is, let's say, standard, uh, a standard way. It's a reliable, it's valid and sensitive, so it was, it's proven. Uh, their, their efficacy. And it's just one question that's called sick, uh, single is question uh, to be performed after each task. In general, post task questionnaire needs to be short. You don't want to have after each task uh, that your participant fill out a 20 questions questionnaire. But they needs to be short, one to three questions. Why? To interfere, as written here, to interfere as little as possible with the flow of execution of the system. Also because typically you have task one and then maybe task two is starting from the end of task one. So you don't want to have long, long pause between one task and the other. So in general, these questions are very, very short, one to three question. In this case, this is called single list question because it's just one single question. And so it's, it's the shortest way to do this post questionnaire task. Uh, so this is experimentally validated. So they have done this task, they have this questionnaire and they validated these, the results. So they are reliable, uh, valid and sensitive to, to the user performance. And as evident, it asked the user, the participant to rate the difficulty of that specific activity that was already, com was just completed from very difficult to very easy on a seven point like a scale with very difficult in this specific task, in this specific question on the left, on the one, and very easy on the seven, with four being neutral, obviously. This is in practice, this is used quite rare, rarely. So it's quite, un, it's quite uncommon to see post-task questionnaire. But 
it, it, it could be an option and some usability study do this because maybe a specific task it is perceived could be perceived differently from the actual execution of the task so maybe you have a lot of errors but the users think that the task is very easy or the task is not completed and the user thinks that it's very easy or vice versa so it could be an additional source of information if you are interested in that is an example, probably the most notable example of post task questionnaire. Uh, we will see a couple of post test questionnaire. So a questionnaire that is administered at the end of the entire session with a participant. And the first one, and we will see two, two of them. The first one is this one, is the SUS, the system usability scale. And the second that we are going to, to see is the NASA TLX. At NASA because it was developed by NASA, the aerospace, the American Aerospace Agency. Uh, so the, the, the SUS questionnaire is basically a set of 10 different questions uh, in which some of them are positive and other are negative. Typically one, three, five, et cetera, are positive and two, four, and so are uh, negative as a question by design. And you see here, it's defined since again, usability is not scientific from that point of view, but it, it was designed as a quick and dirt usability scale invented in 1986. Um, and it's quick and dirt, but it's trustable and measures, again, this is linked to the fact that it's quick and dirt, it measures the perceived usability of a system. So maybe the system is more usable or less usable than the results of the scale or this questionnaire, but this scale measure the perceived usability. The usability that the participant perceive on a system, on a user interface, on a prototype. Uh, made of 10 Likert scale question and where each question different from before is just five options, one to five where one is strongly disagree and five is strongly agree. The results of the post questionnaire source, so you have each participant complete one of these 10 question questionnaire and you put together in some way these numbers and you get a score, a number between zero and 100. And this score between zero and 100 is not equivalent, and this is very important, is not equivalent to a percentage score. And most importantly, you cannot make comparison between uh, different results. So if your system is, is obtaining a 90 and another system is obtaining 95, you cannot say that your system is worse than the other because this is not a percentage. This is just an evaluation for that specific system. This is not how they work. Uh, you cannot say, my system got 90 and the other got 95, so the other is better. No, you can say, only say, since the, again, usability testing is not scientific and this is about the perceived usability and it's quick and dirt as defined by the, the authors. Uh, you can say both of our system getting 90, 95 are pretty good system from a usability standpoint. This is what you can say. And indeed, a SU score above 68 is generally considered above the average. So if you if your system, if you if you have a prototype, you conduct a well done usability study and subminister this questionnaire and you obtain 70, it's a wonderful result. If you obtain 90, it's another wonderful result. It's more it's split, let's say, in areas. Over 68 is above average. Uh, under 68 is not well done. And then you have a, a disaster when you go around uh, lower score. But again, you cannot compare numbers. You can say, okay, our system, both of us are pretty good, are above average, are under average and so on. And these are the 10 questions. Hmm? Ah, uh, let me add one thing that uh, for instance, uh, after a study of SUS, um, of submitting this study or this questionnaire uh, about the website on the internet and evaluating the website on the internet, uh, they discover that uh, if you have a score of SUS 
uh, of 80 or higher, your website is in the top 10% of the most usable website in the world, according to this study that they, they, do, they did. So if you have a website that score 80 or 85 or 90, doesn't matter, this website is among the 10 best websites for the usability standpoint that exist or that were exist when they did this experiment. But again, this is also to reinforce the fact that this, this, this score is not equivalent to percentage score, it's not comparable. You can say, you can just categorize a series of results and put together and say, okay, this is pretty good. Uh, these are the 10 questions of the SUS question, the 10 questions of the SUS questionnaire, they are standard. You, you can find the SUS questionnaire on the internet and they, they are always made in this, in this way. And you can notice that the odd number question are positive uh, while the others are negative. So I think that they would like to use the system frequently. That is positive. And I found the system unnecessary complex, and this is negative. But don't forget that the scale is from one to five, where one is always strongly disagree, and five is always strongly agree. So for the positive question, if you select one, you strongly disagree with a positive affirmation. In the negative question, negative statement, if you strongly disagree with a negative, affirmation. So you are saying that is positive actually. So this difference is again by design and uh, the way in which you compute the score between zero and 100 takes into account this difference in positive and negative, positive, negative, and so on that you have in this 10 question. And this is the way of uh, computing the score. So you got basically quickly, you got uh, either one, uh, a number between one to five for each question, since you have a, a Likert, scale, Likert scale from one to five. Um, so question number one, it's positive and you got one. And question number two is positive and you, maybe, maybe you get five, I don't know. And positive, question number two, you got one. So, how you compute the score? You compute obviously score different for positive statement and for negative statement. For the odd number question, you get the score and subtract one. So the answer for question one is four. And so the, the final score is three, four minus one. For the negative question, you subtract the score for five. So the answer for question two is four again. So the score is one. So they are doing two things in this way. They are normalizing the answer in a way that you are not mixing together positive answer with negative answer. And uh, they are also rescoring, uh, rescaling all the values between zero and four. Instead of one and five, zero and four. Because here, if you get five, you get zero. And here, if you get one, you get zero. So the minimum here is always zero and the maximum value that this could obtain is four. At that point, you sum the score that you obtain. So this three with this one and multiply the total by 2.5. That is quite a magic number that it was empirically uh, derived for, as I said here, getting trustable results, uh, and valid results, but okay, this is a, again, quick and dirt. So just sum some numbers, perform some subtraction, put together um, uh, things and multiply the total. Uh, question, why the second point? The second point about what? Sorry, I missed the second point. What do you mean? This one here. Uh, but essentially for normalizing everything between zero and four. So here you're normalizing the, quest, the, the answer between zero and four because five minus one is four and five minus five is zero. And here to have, uh, not to give more weight to the, those questions, they are doing the same. Uh, and this was by design. Uh, I, 
this was by design also to get the user attention uh, stronger, obviously, because you have the, a positive question, then you have to understand, you have to think that this is negative, so you have to focus. You cannot select five in all the question because otherwise you are messing up things terribly. You have to read the question that you, you know that some questions are positive and some questions are negative. So you are, the participant should be really, really attentive in what he is doing. And so this is why they have these different couples, but they are not creating too much uh, variety, just not to, to, to be more uh, too much, uh, you know, um, to, get, to give much too much problem to, to the user. Uh, this is a possible question for the written exam, what? Tell me all the question of the source. Yeah, it could be, it could be. No, remember all the question, obviously not. Remember the question, it's useless because it's a standard scale. You open any book or Google and you write a source questionnaire, you get all the question in any format that you can imagine. Uh, but the scoring is that specific. Uh, so maybe a question for the exam could be, uh, given a uh, uh, results of uh, a questionnaire, compute the, the score and tell and tell us if the it's average and comments about the results. So if average, it's not average, it's above average and something like that. But no, no don't, don't re remember all the 10 question from the SU score, obviously not. Uh, advantages and disadvantages of SUS because it's nice and it's simple to use in a way. So among the advantages, the reliability of this score has been evaluated over decades. So it's, it's something very consolidated at its own par, the reliability with more complex and costly method, including the NASA that we are going to, to, say, to see, even if they are have significant different. Uh, among the advantages is free, is quick and is simple because you see 10 question and then probably the most complex part is just computing the score, but it's not something that the participant have to do. There's something that you have to do. It's quite used in industry. So it's quite common to see, we apply the score to the system. And there are also some variations to score to include a more specific uh, case. Uh, so because here you see the question are quite uh, general, but maybe you want to have some specific insights from a specific type of system. Maybe it's mobile, maybe it's distributed, maybe it's other, and you need to get to reflect better on this. So there are also variations of this score. Let's say again, uh, recognized variation, not just random invention. And in any way, it's also applicable since the question is quite general to buy a wide range of technology, systems, and products, obviously. Uh, these advantages because it has disadvantages. Uh, one, we already said one, it's not possible to make comparison in a systematic way between two systems and their functionality using SUS. You cannot say my system is better than yours using SUS, or my system has less usability problem than yours by using SUS. You can say our system are quite good. You cannot say anything more than this. Uh, it gives no clue about how to improve the score. You got 80, that's it. How can you move to 85? Who knows? So it's not diagnostic. It's not something that can help you to uh, improve the prototype, improve the system. It's something that give a picture of the prototype in the, of the system in that specific moment. And as I said before, it's a subjective measure of the perceived usability. So it's fine to use source usability testing, but it should not be your only method. So when you do usability testing, you can use source, but you can say, okay, we are just using source and we don't care about any other metrics because it's, it's not enough. It's not diagnostic, it's not possible to make comparison. It's just subjective and it's subjective again of the perceived usability, not even of the real usability. So, it's a nice method, quick, simple, free, because it's just 10 questions, and it's a very simple way to compute the score, but it's not the, the salvation of the, 
uh, of the old usability testing. It's a toolkit that you can use. It's something that you can put in your toolkit to use and to get uh, an idea of how well your system is performing in terms of usability. Another test, post-test, another questionnaire, post-test, post-session, is the NASA Task Load Index, this NASA TLX, that emerged in 98, the 98s, um, and it's made by NASA, um, and measure, this is another, uh, sorry, about what other methods in general, about uh, should there be your only method. Uh, other method, so you can use SAS, SUS as a questionnaire, and then have, have, have other methods, other metrics, other, other criteria as before. Maybe not other questionnaire, because otherwise you are asking participants to fill up 11 different questionnaire, but it's, it's more about other information stemming from usability study not just we did the study and this is the, the SU score and we have done. Because again, you are not learning anything from the usability study. Uh, another kind of questionnaire, totally different from SUS, much, much more complex is this NASA task log index that is, was emerged more or less in the same period, uh, but different from SUS, it doesn't uh, measure the perceived usability of a system, but it, it measure the perceived workload of the user, of the participant, not the usability of the system, the workload uh, of, the, uh, of the person required for completing complex high technical task. You know, NASA, they, are, they were putting people uh, in space and they have high trained people uh, and especially crew members and they want to understand uh, if the interface, maybe not graphical interface, but buttons, levers, and whatever they have, uh, create a too much higher cognitive workload on the uh, participant, on the person. Uh, and they want to understand this because if they have too much stress or too much uh, of people with a too higher cognitive workload, uh, the performance de degree, and if you have any problem, you do have people not able to quickly react. So they want to understand uh, the perceived workload of using a system to calibrate better. So again, it's not about usability, it's more about workload. It's totally about workload of, of a person. Um, and this is a uh, quite difficult questionnaire uh, to, to compute the score, and we are not seeing how to compute different from the SUS, it is quite easy, just a bunch of subtraction, addition, and multiplication. And this is, however, this is terribly useful for studying complex product in uh, and task in high consequence environment, like healthcare, like aerospace, like military, where a, an error of a user could be really, really impactful of, could create disaster, could have people die like in healthcare, uh, something like this. And, and you see here the question, the question about the mental demand, the physical demand of acting on a specific system, the performance, the effort, and you have this long scale between the effort is very low, is very high. They are evaluating the frustration of the user, how insecure, discouraged, irritated, stressed, and annoyed were you in, in doing that task or that set of ta the old task or the session. So it's, it's way more, not about disability, it's not about understanding, it's not about ease of use, it's about workload and fatigue that the person is uh, conducting. Again, very specific, very powerful as a questioner, especially used not for evaluating a mobile application for any target people in the world, but for specific sector like healthcare, like aerospace, like maybe for robots, or if you have equipment that costs uh, millions of euros, euros, and so you, you need particular care, or if it's something that requires uh, cognitive effort to be completed and produce some significant results. Mm -hmm. uh, 
these are six questions, not 10, uh, on an unlabeled, so this is not a Likert scale, this is unlabeled 21 point scale. So you have 21, we have one and 21 from the other side from very low to very high. And each question address one dimension of the perceived workload that are this mental demand, physical demand, time pressure. Um, if you are pressured from time to complete the task, uh, the perceived success with the task, the overall effort, physical, mental, cognitive, uh, et cetera, and the frustration level in the end. If you are stressed, if you're frustrated and you never want to use this again even if you, you need maybe. And respondents, so people, participants wait in each one of the question pertaining to the six categories before, uh, above to indicate which matter most for what they are doing. So they not only answer this, but say, okay, this is particularly important. The physical demand in this specific session, in this specific system is particularly important. Uh, the score, we are not going to see the score. It's a real complex. Uh, if you want, you can open this. This is the pencil, paper and pencil version of the oh, how to compute the score between these six questions with 21 scale, and, and then also considering this, cho this choice. And they also have uh, an application to compute the score, given that the score is not really trivial to, to compute. And they are, you know, have six questions, 21 different answers for each question to put together and so on. Uh, but again, this is. Not about disability, it is about the workload. Very, very useful, very, very powerful, complex to, to score, but very, very powerful for a specific environment in which you are more interested, not only usability, uh, but you are more interested in, the, in having the person not too uh, overloaded and ready to use your uh, system, whatever it is. Again, think that is was born in NASA. Uh, and so they have aerospace, they have shuttles, they have, uh, high training people in high problematic also some, sometimes situations. So they need to, to, to be careful about not giving too much workload to the user in any sense from physical to mental and so on. And here, and we are almost running up our time, but also slides here, you can have some fine. If you want some sample script, we are creating one tomorrow, more or less. A start to create one tomorrow, but here you can download some usability test scripting with no task, but the structure could be here, but it's more or less is the structure that we have seen in the slides or the, the informal consent to the list of tasks, the, the text that the facilitator is telling to each the user. And there is also a link how to create good task in addition uh, or including, I don't remember now uh, the, The, the task uh, elicitation phase that he, that we have seen at the beginning of the course. So this is planning. At the end of this phase, you have a list of tasks, you have the text that the facilitator is going to say, you have to decide the matrix, you have decided the methodology, you have decided which questionnaire you want to, to say after a beginning, uh, at the beginning of each task or uh, at the beginning of each test. And so you are, you will be experimenting this with uh, a, a few people that are your friends or colleague and that you are, now ready to run the study and analyze the results. So a few details about running. First of all, again, get the informed consent. Always get informed consent. It's better in written format, obviously, because you can keep that. Uh, one person, as we said before, act as the facilitator and the rest of the team or a subset of the rest of the team uh, are the observer and at least one of the observer are the note takers. If you have more note takers, probably it's better because you can uh, get more information and remember more information, uh, maybe without the needs to uh, audio record all the sessions. As part of the, the informal concept, but in general, the beginning of the test and uh, the introduction that the facilitator is doing, tell each participant that they are not under evaluation. It's not a test of their capability. The test is on the app. You are testing the system. You are testing the app, not the user. And any mistake is not the user fault, but is the application fault. This is important to get the right tone in the usability testing. We, you are not under examination. You are testing this, but you are, you are testing 
the application, not we are testing you as a person. So this is extremely important to say at the beginning uh, of the of the introduction uh, of, the of the session of the script. Uh, the facilitator, except when uh, they decide to use the cooperative, uh, obviously evaluation methodology, uh, should always follow the script. So to provide the same information to all the participants, remain neutral, not give suggestion, not say, no, you are doing wrong, not just click there, all these things, don't say this. Don't help the participant and provide clear information. The same information to everybody in a clear way without too many help. Uh, task can be given in a written form one of the time. So this is task number one. This is task number two. Once the first task is completed, etc. Or also vocally, as you prefer. It depends how long the task is. If it's quite simple and short, could it also be uh, said vocally? But the same task to everybody. Uh, the facilitator must encourage participant to adopt and explain the uh, chosen methodology at the right moment. So if you decide to use the think aloud methodology task number four, once you arrive at task number four, but you should give instruction to the participant of what is think aloud and what is expected to do and all the people should receive more or less the same information. Note takers and observer should take notes obviously of the participant behavior, all the comments, all the error, and also some hints about the completion, success or failure of each task. In addition, maybe to what the, the system or other tools are doing for the success uh, of, of the task. So the much information, the richer information, the note taker can take, the better is for the analysis. And, you run the, the, the usability testing when the system is ready to measure in some way all the, the criteria that you define. It could be the application, the system that is performing this um, measurement alone, it could be a camera or audio recording and so on, all the things that we have said about equipment. Then you do the test, participant one, participant two, participant three, et cetera, up to all the participants that you want or need to, uh, to recruit. In the end, you may have some debriefing sessions separately with the participant. In the end, you have a bunch of data, the, the notes taken by the observer, uh, but also uh, maybe error logs, maybe timestamp, maybe audio recording, and so on. Uh, you need to analyze in some way the collected data, response to the questionnaire. You have to analyze the collected data to find problems, and especially way to improve this pro to the, the interface to take all this problem. How? Well, it depends on the task, obviously, but you should also for sure consider all the metrics that you decided to collect per task, per participant. Maybe also for some metrics make sense overall. It depends. Uh, quantitative data can be in an, anal an, anal an analysis, analysis summarized like, okay, the success rate for task one for all participants was around, was in mean 80%, plus minus 10%. The task time, same. Task number one, ask this, have this, uh, require this time to be completed, error rates, satisfaction questionnaire. I was satisfied by, by the user system, the participants say, between four and five, for instance, where four is, where five is very satisfied. Uh, look for trends and keep account of problem that account across participants. Maybe you notice a participant number one doing something or comment something or click somewhere that is wrong and then participant number two do the same thing and then participant number four do, do the same thing. So you can, you see a trend, you can see uh, something that is happened frequently. So you can ask this participant and also maybe participant number five, if this thing is happening to you and also participant number two that didn't exhibit this behavior, but you can ask in a, in the briefing session about this. And instead of more qualitative open information, you can try to summarize, analyze in some way. There are a lot of way in, in HCI to do this, uh, but for, for the usability testing, uh, it's it, typically you have to extract, uh, so in a quick way, let me say in a quick way, not formal, uh, you have to extract some common theme, common topic that emerge 
from the observation and also might be some precise uh, topic that emerge like okay all the participant or all the participant except one uh, think that this label is uh, not understandable is unclear so this is maybe this is something really qualitative that maybe emerge in a debriefing session that is an action that you can do to improve the prototype it is just changing the label for instance or this color is not uh, is too bright or something like this that they are totally qualitative because you maybe get this during the debriefing session, uh, but they are useful for improving the usability of your uh, system or your application. Okay. And finally, th these are some references, uh, as always. Um, a lot of references. There is also another page about the SUS, the usability scale, and, and also uh, the NASA TLX and the single lease question. Uh, an overview of what we have again said in these slides. So given that it is one minute before 7 uh, p.m., we can obviously stop here uh, with this. And we also have completed these uh, lectures about the usability testing. Tomorrow we'll do uh, an exercise about usability testing. Since you have in your groups, your team to conduct, to plan, run, and analyze results from a usability study for your prototype before the exam. So having a running example that you can uh, use in addition to the links reported here, especially scripts could be useful, could be actually useful for, for your group to better contextualize things. So I'm stopping the recording while I'm stop sharing everything. If you have any other question, please write them in the chat. Otherwise we will uh, talk here tomorrow.